2017, we decided to travel across Spain once again along the Camino de Santiago. Now, we prepared for this journey and we concentrated on preparing ourselves physically, but also we had to spend some time on deciding what gear we were going to bring with us. For example, this hat, this was one of my favorites. It uh, did such a really good job of keeping the sun off of my head, but also allowing my head to stay cool. That was important. And as I learned on our 2014 hike, well-fitting boots are very important for an enjoyable trip and a happy body because your feet are going to swell no matter what you think. So you need to buy boots that are going to accommodate that. And finally, poles. We both took poles. We highly recommend them. They were a really good asset. And they're great until you try to take them through Spanish airport security. And they designate them as a lethal weapon. And that's a story in and of itself that you'll have to ask me about at a different time. So we did all this preparation, and it was loads of fun. But the overall journey, the Camino, wasn't about the physical aspect. It wasn't about the delicious food or the wonderful wine. It was about something entirely different. Now, Alice and I both log our adventures when we take them, and we log them in journals. Uh, the story you're getting ready to hear is a reflection of those recordings in our journals. And we want to make sure that we say thank you to all those that we've mentioned, but also to those that we have forgotten to mention. Um, we really appreciate each and every one of you. You made the journey absolutely wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. God, you called your servant Abraham from Ur in Chaldea, watching over him in all his wanderings, and guided the Hebrew people as they crossed the desert. Guard these, your children, who for love of your name make a pilgrimage to Compostela. Be their companion on the way, their guide at the crossroads, their strength in weariness, their defense in dangers, their shelter on the path, their shade in the heat, their light in darkness, their comfort in discouragement, and the firmness of their intentions that through your guidance, they may arrive safely at the end of their journey and enriched with grace and virtue, may return to their homes filled with salutary and lasting joy. 12th Century Pilgrimage Prayer. In the summer of 2014, Alice and I walked 600 miles across Spain along the way of St. James or the Camino de Santiago. During that trip, we had some amazing adventures and also learned a lot about ourselves. The physical difficulty of the trip and the epic nature of such a walk had convinced us that this was a once-in-a-lifetime adventure. However, 18 months after returning, I'd become restless for another adventure, and we decided to repeat the journey along the Camino. Hi, dear. Hi. Now that I think about it, the start of our journey was long before our send-off from church. More accurately, when Mark and I convinced Nadine, Ken, and our friend Cindy to go on their first Camino, and when Mark began planning local hikes. This training time, hiking with family and friends, warms my heart with wonderful memories and provided a fun new dynamic to our preparation. Many of our friends and friends of friends joined us when they were able even our own grown kiddos tagged along on occasion. Time spent together hiking and talking was a great way to build and deepen relationships with those who bravely ventured out with us. The weekend before leaving, we met one last time for a dinner together. We shared our hopes and prayers for each other. For Allison, everyone prayed that she would not suffer a repeat of the difficult physical problems of 2014. For me, everyone hoped that I would gain my wish to connect with and focus more on my fellow pilgrims. The start of our 2017 Camino began with a nice send-off from church with our pastor and friend Jeff reading out loud the pilgrimage prayer at the end of the early service. On May 21st, Ken, Nadine, Allison, and I boarded our flight to Spain, Cindy having already set off two days earlier. This is a story of our adventures, 
both together and apart. Our journey to our starting point took us from Charlotte to Madrid. Although I got little sleep on the flight, the highlight of the day was waking up next to my hubby, who was always a cheerful morning person. I, however, am not. Thank goodness for coffee. The many paths, all called the Camino de Santiago, fan out across Spain and into the rest of Europe. They all lead to the city of Santiago de Compostela in the northwest corner of Spain. The route we chose is called the Camino Frances, or the French Way. We planned to pick up the trail in a tiny village of saint jean pied in the foothills of the French Pyrenees. This starting point creates a major challenge of crossing the Pyrenees Mountains at the very start of the journey. Upon arriving in saint jean pied I directed Ken and Nadine to the Pilgrim's Passport Office. Here they were able to ask questions of volunteers and receive useful information, such as a map and a list of a few lodging places. Volunteers assist travelers at the same time in various languages. Each volunteer has hiked the Camino de Santiago before, some several times. At the Pilgrim office, you also present your credential documents. This little booklet identifies you as a pilgrim and serves as the record of your journey. Most places you stay during the night, most churches and many other shops, schools, and even bars offer their own stamp for the pilgrims to record their journey. Of course, receiving the first stamp on your pilgrim's passport is really encouraging and means the journey has officially begun. We wandered down the street a little way after leaving the pilgrim's office and took some pictures, purchased water and food, and explored the town for a while. I successfully sent Nadine and Ken on their way up the mountain toward Orison, our first place of lodging. It was a nice blessing to be able to assist and send them off, although I know Mark had really been looking forward to this exact moment. Mark arrived by cab at 3.15 p.m. Not that I was anxiously keeping track of time or anything. When I finally arrived in Saint-Jean, Allison was waiting for me and we checked in at the Pilgrim's office ourselves. Because of our late start, Allison and I had to really push to make it to our first albergue, the only one along the journey that requires a reservation. Hi. Struggling in the heat. Oh baby, yep. It was hot, and we were tired and suffering from jet lag, and the opening leg of our pilgrimage was very difficult. At saint jean Pour, there, Zoom in on it. It's where we started this about an hour and a half ago. The scenery was amazing. But we did make it in two hours with just 10 minutes to spare before we would have lost our beds and seats at the dinner table. I was a hot mess, so that quick shower was heavenly, even if my hair was dripping wet at the dinner table. The communal family style dinner was plentiful, hearty, and delicious. I was thankful for the group of Germans who included me in their group, even if my German was atrocious. My plate seemed to magically stay full, thanks to the man beside me. I must have looked as though I needed some serious sustenance. Patience in communicating is one of the wonderful ways people interact, and I just know that God is at the core of this. It is humbling at times, but always worth the effort. Early the next morning, we woke to the mountain pass, socked in a thick fog. Before we set out on our first full day of mountain hiking, I took a moment to ask Nadine, Allison, and Ken about their first day. Nadine, tell me one thing about yesterday. Yesterday was really chaotic. I felt like things were a little crazy with Mark getting not on the same flight that we were on, <laughs> but at the same time, I also felt assured that everything was gonna be okay. Awesome. Wifey, tell me one thing about yesterday. One thing about yesterday. Well, since she covered that base, I'm going to say, you know, it's amazing in your mind how much easier this first, that first day was than how, what it actually is. <laughs> it was hard. And, and never, ever to do something like that with lack of sleep, jet lag, and you're not feeling great. <laughs> Amen. All right, Buen Camino, guys. Now your turn. Tell me one thing about yesterday. Steep. 
<laughs> Very steep. <laughs> Quite a walk. After a wonderful night's sleep in the quiet mountains, we woke to fog as thick as pea soup. The fog provided a mysterious effect that was actually refreshing, and it eventually dissipated. The stunning scenery climbing and crossing the Pyrenees Mountains made me wonder how anyone can deny the existence of God. I was enjoying the beauty of his creations all around me. The wild horses that approached us through the fog out of curiosity made the morning even more memorable. On day two, we crossed over the cattle grate that marks the border between France and Spain. I reflected on a quote I'd read from a medieval pilgrim who had passed this spot hundreds of years ago. We glance back at France, saying, Goodbye. God only knows if we'll ever see you again. And saying this, when we took our first steps down the mountain, tears came to our eyes, and a certain nostalgia came into our hearts. And that is how we were for an hour, without being able to speak to one another as we walked downward towards Roncevallis. Roncevallis, by the way, translates to the Valley of Thorns. Our two days crossing the mountains were both difficult and wonderful as our backs got used to the weight of the pack, our legs to the constant motion, and our feet to the natural wear and tear of walking 17 miles a day. Already I'd noticed a difference from our 2014 pilgrimage. I'd spent much more time listening to the stories of other pilgrims. One German gentleman was walking in dedication to his wife, who had recently passed away. Several others were walking to seek answers, or for the challenge and adventure. Each person was fresh, but few knew what to expect in the days ahead. Now, after crossing the Pyrenees Mountains, I was really exhausted and looking forward to a good night's sleep. So we checked into a small albergue and when it was ready to go to bed, and I usually quickly fall asleep, and I did so that evening, but then I started having this strange dream. And I don't, you normally recall dreams, but the dream was, well, I thought it was grizzly bears, then it switched to chainsaws, then grizzly bears, then chainsaws. And I woke up during this time and I realized, oh, it's a gentleman snoring across the room. Oh my goodness, I've never heard snoring so loud before in my life, and I probably never will again. Unfortunately, this poor man suffered from severe sleep apnea. So along with praying, oh Lord, please let me get a little bit of sleep tonight, <laughs> I also prayed for, oh, please let him live through the night. So the next morning, as we're preparing to exit our albergue, another gentleman scooted by us out the door, and he proceeded to, which was sadly very funny, but it did transcend all language barriers. Our third night, however, was the most peaceful experience of my life. After a beautiful pilgrim's dinner and devotion service hosted by some local nuns, we slept in semi-private rooms. Instead of the typical and abrupt alarms and turning on of lights at 6 a.m., this albergue piped in soft Gregorian chant of slowly increasing volume. Now, I'm clearly not a connoisseur of Gregorian chant, but I've decided that this must be the alarm system in heaven. I've never in my life started out a day so peacefully. Now, midway through day three, we were walking along a pretty narrow section of the Camino that had a steep hill running down the right-hand side. And in the distance, I thought I heard someone 
crying for help, ayudame, ayudame, which in Spanish is help me, help me. So we went ahead pretty fast and we saw this lady who had been riding a bike and had, her bike had wrecked off the side of the hill and she was hurt. And we tried to ask her if we could help her up but she said it was not possible that I really thought that she had hurt herself. And she let us know that her husband had biked on ahead and had not, didn't know really that she had uh, been in an accident. So I tried to run as fast as I could to catch up with his bike. Uh, meanwhile, Allison and Nadine and Ken stayed behind and helped the lady. And this is one of those few times, uh, one of three actually, that I felt that God had just put us in the exact right place at the right time to, to help somebody else on this Camino. It was really awesome. To those who have not experienced it, it's hard to describe the feeling you get passing over a great mountain range. The physical difficulty is ever present, but it doesn't consume you. The feeling, however, of your first perspective of the range behind you brings a mix of emotions, relief, pride, and even sadness of the challenge being behind you. They all envelop you. Crossing the Pyrenees is a feat, no doubt. The elevation and distance are significant. And after those days, you can feel a genuine pride about what you've accomplished. Any such feelings are tempered, however, when you look ahead. Your pilgrimage has just begun. Many mountains await. Many, many more miles lie before you. Many adventures, many pains, and many joys all lie ahead. So you set your back to your accomplishment and move on. Buen Camino. God was evident everywhere I looked, from the beautiful mountains to the people encountered every day, and the amazing structures and art designed and built to glorify Him. The prayers of friends and family for less physical difficulty for me this trip worked. Because even at the end of each day, I was able to embrace spending time with people and enjoy the places with a much more thankful attitude than my 2014 trip. My mind and body were resting, relaxing, and I truly enjoyed the now moment. Having peace in the moments was rewarding, and being provided with so many prayerful and thankful opportunities was wonderful. By the end of the fourth day, we'd walked over 50 miles and made our way through the famous city of Pamplona. We'd left the coolness of the mountains, and the weather had definitely turned hot. The fifth day involved climbing the Alto de Perdon, and we made the decision to get an extra early start. At this point, I should remind you that I'm a morning person. And Allison, well, not so much. But she was a great sport and got up with me at 5 a.m. to beat the heat. 5 a.m.? We're excited and happy. It's cool. We are not getting sunburned. That's good. Um, so today we're going up to... Uh, Alto de Perdón, which is the mountain of pardon, forgiveness, um, and uh, we'll see what happens, but we hope to climb this big hill before it gets too hot outside. So. Anyway, another day on Camino. Excited? Oh, yeah, after I wake up, yes, maybe after in a couple of hours. After you have your first cafe con leche? You haven't even had one yet. Been here four days. We skipped the coffee. I'm not sure what's wrong with me. <laughs> it is really weird. One of the things we remember most about our last trip was, um, was the coffees and getting up every morning and having this lovely coffee. And I haven't had one yet. I know. It was so good. Yeah. So, well, I guess I won't film too much longer because I could be taking pictures of <laughs> the tops of our heads. Yeah. Or... We might make ourselves sick if we try to leave this. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> When you walk long distances, the days quickly begin to blur together. You settle into a comfortable and easy routine that replaces the busyness of life at home. You wake early and begin walking within 30 minutes. After a couple of hours, you stop at a cafe and have some of the best coffee on the planet and a light breakfast. After a few more hours of walking and lunch, you've already covered the average 15 to 17 miles and you begin to consider where to stop for the night. Once you've selected an albergue, you shower, wash your clothes, and hang them out to dry before kicking up your feet and resting your weary legs. 
The next morning you begin the routine over. But the routine occasionally gets broken when you run into something unexpected. In 2014, we walked through the city of Sagun during the running of the Bulls, which I had excitedly joined. This year, nothing as exciting as that happened. But then we entered the village of Siraki. The name Siraki translates to Nest of Vipers. Don't you love the village names in Europe? There, we did get invited to listen in as a local men's group practiced some folk singing in preparation for a cross-village rival competition. These men sang songs praising their village and other love songs in an alcove of a 13th century church of San Roman. I think they loved having an audience. So this is turning into a stupid long day. Um, we've uh, started out, I've forgotten now where we started out. Siraki. Siraki. And um, our intent was to go just past Estella, just past Irachi. But the lodging between there and Los Arcos was very limited. So we said we'll take a stab at Montjuran. Um, they were completely full. And unfortunately it's another 12 kilometers. Getting lost in the Camino Day is something I really look forward to recapturing. It's hard to explain, but despite the clearly strenuous activity of covering so many miles, I find the whole routine very relaxing. Very often in my journal, I note how happy and relaxed I feel during the entire journey. But this year, my greatest joys were found in being caught, or rather placed, in situations that go well beyond the serendipitous. At one such time as we were leaving the village of Siraki, we came across a young lady who had met, actually met the evening before. And she had been reading her Bible, and uh, we stopped and asked her what she thought of it. And she said, well, honestly, I'm a new Christian, and I've been reading the Bible kind of cover to cover, and she'd gotten as far as Isaiah. And she said, isn't Christianity supposed to be about Jesus? I mean, where is he in this story? And then she said, I don't really understand it. And something about what she said reminded me so much of a story in Acts. And Alice and I were very privileged for the next several hours to be able to walk with her and spend time with her and discuss the gospel, at least as far as we knew it anyway, and discuss that with her. Our two paths took us different directions that day. She went one way and we had to go a different one. But we knew that we would meet her again. Our path took us down a less traveled woodland route to the Monastery of Arachi and its famous wine fountain. Hola. Hola. What are we doing today? Walking. Oh, again. surprise. I know, it's totally shocking. We're bypassing one city, so we took the scenic route. And you wouldn't believe it, but the scenic route involves walking over a bridge across the interstate. Not having to worry about nightly accommodation is something that sets the Camino apart from almost every other vacation. Finding a place to stay is rarely a problem. Mark and I both thought we would stop for the day by 2 p.m. at the latest. Frustratingly, the two small towns we passed through in the early afternoon had no vacancies, 
so we found ourselves committed to walking another 10 miles. Thank goodness the next town was larger, and we were able to call ahead and reserve a room as we walked, without lunch, in the hot sun. You might be thinking that doesn't look very much fun, not very exciting, and to be perfectly honest, stretches like this aren't, but you just get through them. Okay, so not all days are fun. Maybe God did make the day challenging just to remind me that He is in all things and still provides what is needed. Stumbling into Los Arcos after trudging 23 miles, our hotel was right on our path and a private bed and bath were heaven sent. Finding our lodging for the night came just in time. As we were checking into our hotel, at 6.45 p.m. was the first time I recall ever having to physically concentrate to stay upright. Lessons learned. One, do not skip lunch when hiking crazy long distances in the heat. And two, electrolyte drinks were invented for such a time as this. Dinner at a local restaurant was fabulous, and I appreciated every bite. Each albergue is unique but certain ones stand out due to the love and caring they provide. This year, we were fortunate to stay at several unique places, including the belfry of a 14th century church in the village of Granyon and the crypt of a 9th century monastery of Samos. The church of San Juan Bautista in Granyon is a tiny place with a gigantic heart. You are greeted by the volunteer Hospitalateras and made part of the family immediately. Unlike most albergues, Granyon encourages everyone to participate in the preparation of the communal meal. Now, Alice and I had read about this place before we had arrived, so we immediately volunteered to be the head chefs for the 25 or so other pilgrims that would be staying that night. Now, I expected the Hospital of Terra to accept my offer and then instruct me on exactly what was on the menu for the evening. Boy, was I surprised when she said, Oh, that's wonderful, thank you. What will you be preparing? I stood there for a moment in a bit of shock before Allison came to my rescue by saying, Can we see your pantry? Well, that's all it took. We were off and running and prepared, with the help of several other pilgrims, a hearty soup and salad that seemed to be a hit. Our experience went beyond cooking a meal. There was singing, a time of meditation, and genuine camaraderie. Even the laundry experience was unique. Since it was a rainy afternoon, all the clothes were hung to dry in the unfinished, since the 1300s, attic space. Leaving Granyon the next morning, we entered the longest and second-to-last region in Spain, Castile and Niel, the medieval seat of Ferdinand and Isabella. The largest city in this region is Burgos. In 2014, we barely made it out of Burgos, a story in itself. But this year, Allison's feet had held up, and neither of us were suffering the effects of the 140 miles we'd walked so far. However, when we were about five hours away from the city, Allison started feeling poorly. Allison's feeling a little puny this morning, a little stomach thing. So, what I'm convinced that she needs is some pick me up music. So, here we go. I had developed a fever and picked up a stomach bug. I am sure I looked very odd wearing all my clothing layers because the day was anything but cold. As we were still struggling to limp into the city, we sat at an outdoor cafe for a break. I was worried for Allison, but we both thought it was funny when a local farmer walked past carrying a scythe. I joked to Allison that hopefully death was a little premature. Despite feeling awful, we struggled into Burgos. Walking toward Burgos in the distance there. Yep, oh, Allison taking off her jacket. It's warm in the sun, but Allison not feeling well has had her jacket on because she's been chilled. Not a good sign. 
This was also my sister-in-law's birthday, and I had been looking forward to meeting up with her for a fun celebration. My gift to Nadine was to stay shivering in bed at a hotel burrowed under all the blankets. I can remember waking up periodically throughout the night to wonderful, soothing pan flute music and then drifting off to sleep again. Mark's recall of the pan flute episode is quite different. All night in the hotel, as I tried to sleep, worried about my wife, some street performer just outside our window repeated the same three stanzas of Bridge Over Troubled Water on his pan flute. I may never forgive him. Allison's feeling all better? I feel much better. Good. This morning I wasn't so sure. Okay. But I could eat, so we were doing great. All right. When you can't eat and drink, it makes it very difficult to walk in the heat. <laughs> yes. The good news is I was all better the next day, which was fantastic since it was my birthday. What a great gift. Thank you, God, for good health. Being able to enjoy the beautiful city of Burgos made the day even better. It's amazing what we did in just one day. Visited the stunning cathedral, explored the interior of the city walls, sampled local tapas, embraced siesta, hiked up to the castle, shopped in a local supermarket, ate a fabulous salad dinner with friends, and relaxed. The best birthday present of the day was being able to spend all day exploring with my hubby and having my clothes laundered at a laundromat. Our day's rest in Burgos had another significance for us. It was here that for one day, Cindy, Nadine, and Ken and I were all together in the same city, and we were able to spend a few hours together. It was wonderful to hear everyone's stories. Ken and Nadine were having a wonderful time. Cindy was as well but needed a day to rest her feet and legs, which were beginning to give her problems. These problems would eventually force her to bus ahead a bit and really slow down. The Camino itself covers several different terrains and regions. From Burgos, the terrain changes dramatically as you enter the vast open Meseta. Of all the areas along the way, the Meseta was something I looked forward to nearly as much as the mountains I love. Its beauty is the beauty of the open plains, wheat fields, and vistas that stretch to the horizon. It's also a bit quirky. In the U.S., this is like the region where you would find the world's largest ball of yarn, or a barn made out of corn. We pass, for example, an albergue, where you could sleep in an American Indian-style teepee, or even a large concrete pipe. Very odd. The Meseta is approximately in the middle of the Camino Frances path and a section many pilgrims choose to skip. To be truthful, I was dreading this eight-day stretch. As it turned out, the weather cooled down and it was a wonderful time of peaceful inner examination and quiet surroundings. The trail had fewer people on it, the towns were smaller and less populated, and the walking refreshingly peaceful. Hello, dear wife. Hello, dear hubby. So, what's up? What decision do you have to make tonight? Oh, you're trying to convince me to get up at 5 a.m. I'm pretty sure I'm not budging from 6. Because <laughs> <laughs> we are not behind schedule. We do not need to brush. <laughs> it's not going to accomplish anything, and I don't care, even if that means I get eight hours of sleep. Do not use logic. <laughs> what time is it now? 8.30. 8.30, and we're getting ready to do what? Go to bed. <laughs> 8.30, we're going to bed, but you want nine hours of sleep, nine and a half hours sleep. Do not use logic, do not add, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good reason to go to bed then. It is, and yeah. you better cut that off if you want to live. <laughs> With the path smooth and straight, it's easier to let your mind wander and relax on the Meseta. Everything slows down a bit. Conversations are even easier. Almost all of the pilgrims on the Meseta have been walking for several days. And it was here that, on one sunny afternoon, I sat in the backyard of an albergue, and two German gentlemen sat at the next table. I know a little German, but rarely get to practice it. 
we began a conversation in a mix of their rudimentary English and my even more limited German. Very soon into the conversation, it was clear that these two had a very special story. They had been walking sections of the Camino all the way from their home near Nuremberg, Germany. We talked about each other's families, hometowns, and faiths. These two Christian gentlemen, Gerhard and Edgar, had a wonderful life's motto, Nichts ist zum Fall, or nothing is random. For the next few days, we saw each other as we walked and spent the afternoons talking and dining together. It was also on the Meseta that we first started running into a group of young people that we nicknamed the Kids, because they were just a bit older than our own children. We would walk with the kids on and off the rest of the journey, all the way to Santiago. But more about them later. After six days walking in the quiet and remote Meseta, mountains begin to appear on the horizon. Our day had been stressful because we had chosen to walk into, through, and out of the city. The route followed alongside many busy roads and an interstate for the entire day. That was just mentally exhausting. I feel that some people that are listening to this story may get the impression that every place we stayed was ancient or quaint, but that is not true as evidenced by the albergue outside of Lyon in the village of Valverde de la Virgin. Our feet and legs were quite tired after two long days that covered almost 50 miles. The albergue was located up on a hill overlooking the most unscenic view possible, a busy highway intersection. But using trees and fencing to buffer the sound, it was surprisingly relaxing, however. So is this place awesome or what? It rocks. (laughs) Warm sand, feels good on the toes. The proprietor signed us in, carried our wonderfully fragrant backpacks to our bed, provided us with a free beverage, and even washed our laundry for us. Not to mention these people also prepared a three-course family-style home-cooked meal. In my mind, I always refer to this albergue as the hammock place because they had a sun shelter with heavy-duty hammocks hung under the shade. I really could have just slept there instead of the bunk bed inside. They also had foot baths and a relaxing soft sand area, too. All they were missing was an actual masseuse. As the mountains on the horizon became nearer, our pace quickened. Alice and I both loved the mountains. We passed by Opital de Abrigo and its famous Knight's Bridge that reeks of legend. We passed by David's Donativo cart that had so impressed us in 2014. David is still there, offering for free an even larger selection of gifts to the thousands of pilgrims that pass each day. We passed Pedro, still strumming his guitar and still singing the exact same song. And then we reached Astorga. Look, a movie being taken without us walking. Here I'd planned a little surprise for Alice. We're in Astorga. It's our day, rest day. It's our anniversary. Happy anniversary, dude. Happy anniversary, sweetie. Smooching on the camera. Walking into Astorga was exciting as we climbed up the steep streets into town. I was looking forward to spending some time in this beautiful little city, which we only walked through back in 2014. Mark had secretly made a reservation in a hotel, a very nice place. 
As I walked into the room, I noticed a platter of fruit, pot of chocolate, wine, and real wine glasses on the table in the sitting room. What a wonderful anniversary surprise. We decided to treat ourselves to massages in the adjoining spa. I went first and picked the relaxing chocolate-infused oil massage plus an additional foot massage. Both were heavenly and worth every penny. Back upstairs in our room, I raved about my spa experience. Next, it was Mark's turn. Unwisely, he chose a sports massage, which to his defense was subtitled Perfect for Pilgrims. When I opened the room door to him after his massage, his face was comical. He said he felt as though he had been beaten. Basically, he had chosen a deep tissue massage, which is not relaxing at all. The cherry on top of our anniversary in Astorga was finding a classy local restaurant where the food was amazing. So amazing, we went back the next evening, too. Okay, we're back on the road again after two days rest. Oh, I tell you, our bodies were kind of hoping it was over. <laughs> <laughs> Not mentally so much, but getting going again. Whew. Yeah. Getting the ankle complex warmed up again and putting on that pack and feeling that weight again. Yeah. When we left Astorga, we were in for a two-day climb to the highest point on the Camino de Santiago. And we were a little concerned that after a few days off, we'd find the long walk difficult. It took a little longer than usual to get those leg muscles stretched out. But we were soon off at our regular pace. It felt good to be walking again. And we were really beginning to go fast. As a result, we made it to our destination before 1 p.m. and got to really chill in the high-altitude village of Fonsebedon. This village is the highest-altitude village on the Camino, and it is a launching point for many pilgrims that want to make it to the summit before sunrise the next morning. All five of the kids were there, and we spent the evening together. The kids were a diverse group of pilgrims that had met each other along the way, Esther is a beautiful young lady from New Zealand. Josh and Matt, two brothers from Louisiana. Andre, a 30-something living in Austria. And dear Annika from Budapest. They were all full of life, and hanging out with them was a great joy for Allison and I. I'm not sure if we adopted them or they us, but from Fonsebedon on, there were few days that we didn't spend at least a few moments together. Very early the next morning, we woke and started walking in the dark. Our goal was sunrise at the top of Monterago, at the site of the Cruz de Ferro, or Iron Cross. This site is the most private and solemn site along the way. It is a simple thing. A small iron cross mounted atop a 30-foot pole planted at the peak of the mountain and surrounded by a 15-foot mound of stone but it is those stones that make this place unusual. Although the origin is not certain, today each stone represents a burden that the pilgrim carries. Each stone represents something that the pilgrim wishes to leave behind, either a grief or a guilt or a memoria or an honor. In addition to stones, you see other items, pictures of lost parents or lost children, small toys, ribbons, and flags. When we arrived at the peak, it was twilight. The full moon illuminated the area. There were about 12 other pilgrims there, but everyone was silent, standing still in front of the cross. Occasionally, one pilgrim would take a step forward and stand before the cross, perhaps say a prayer, perhaps bow in a moment of meditation, some even falling to their knees and weeping. Invariably, they would pull out a stone from their pack or their pocket and lay it down at the foot of the cross. And then they would stand and walk away in silence and continue along the Camino. Alison and I stood by, watching the colors of the sky glow and warm and brighten. Then, in our turn, we also walked to lay down our stone. No one asks why, or what your burden represents. It's personal, private, and precious. 
After an hour or so, we walked away in the brightening morning. The trail is steeply downhill from here, one of the toughest parts of the Camino, and one where many injuries occur. We descended from the mountain into the Barrizzo Valley, full of orchards and vineyards. As we entered the valley, we had walked over 300 miles along the way, but one last big climb, the steepest, and the final region of Galicia awaited us after a two-day crossing of the valley. So tell me about it. About what? It. it. About our fun day of getting caught in a thunder and lightning storm. Yeah, we were in a thunder and lightning storm. That was exciting. And it came with a gusto. It started off with hail. Yeah. It was great. We stayed under our shelter for a while and thought, oh, oh, it's going to pass. So we had our rain gear on, which was good because about 10 minutes later, round number two got loose. Yeah. <laughs> We got caught in it. The weather had been hot throughout most of our trip, but dry. In fact, we'd only had a few drops of rain the entire 22 days of our Camino so far. So it was inevitable as we approached the wettest region of Galicia that we should see some rain. As we began to climb the foothills of the Cantabrian Mountains, we heard faint rumblings of thunder in the distance. As the sound grew stronger, we made the decision to ready for rain. Allison and I took shelter under a nearby farmer's shed to wait out the storm. After about 15 minutes, the worst of the storm seemed to have passed, so we made the decision to get back on the trail. We sloshed along in waterlogged boots, laughing at the ridiculous situation we found ourselves in. And then to our rear, we heard laughing and splashing. Without looking back, Mark and I both thought, I bet it's the kids. Sure enough, we turned around. We saw them running in the rain and sliding in the mud. The next day was the steep climb into Galicia and the village of Othiebro. I think this is it. We cross from Castel and Leon to the final province here. Right in the tip of the tip of the thumb, we are entering into Galicia. Walking into Galicia is like walking into an entire other country. Everything changes. The architecture, the food, and even the language. Galicia is a region of dairy farming and fishing, of slate roofs and Celtic runes. The mountaintop of Othiebro to Santiago is only a seven days walk. The end of our pilgrimage was coming into focus. But we spent one last night and watched the sun set from the top of the mountains. The warm colors of the sunset made the evening relaxing. Several of our fellow pilgrims, including the kids, were sharing the mountaintop village with us, and we all exchanged memories of how we had started out what seemed like a lifetime ago. We finished our walk the next day at the town of Samos, the site of a 6th century active monastery and one of the world's largest. I was certainly surprised by its size, looking down on it earlier in the day from the trail. It is a city unto itself. I would imagine the surrounding town had developed because of the monastery's existence. That night we slept in the monastery crypt, so we can truly say we slept like the dead. Actually, sleeping in a crypt sounds creepier than it really is, but it was still amazing to be spending the night in a structure that had seen the fall of Rome, survived the Moorish invasions, Napoleon and the Spanish Civil War. So much history. The ancient portion of the crypt wasn't dangerous, of course, but a modern addition just outside got my attention. 
not four feet from the exterior wall were active gas pumps. Burned into my mind is my memory of one of the monks grabbing a lit cigarette from a man's mouth and crushing it while fussing at him in Spanish just outside the front door by said gas pumps. Hola, dear. Hola. So, what are we getting ready to do? Head down into the city. Yep, to got, Santiago. Got to the top of Montegozo, the mountain of joy. Yep. And uh, we didn't do what the book described, which is in our first side of the city, fall to our knees in tears at the joy of... <laughs> The problem is, if we fell down our knees, we might not get back. Might not get back up now. <laughs> the last five days walk into Santiago was difficult for me. Not physically, but mentally and emotionally. All of the preparation to make such a journey has taken you nearly 500 miles across Spain. Your body is physically drained, but you don't want to stop. You don't want it to end. And yet the end is coming, and it's coming quickly. The path gets progressively more crowded and more touristy. School and other tour groups join the pilgrims in their walk. It becomes much harder to feel like a pilgrim on a long journey. I had read stories of ancient pilgrims that upon reaching the hill called Montegozo or Mountain of Joy and catching their first glimpse of Santiago would break down in tears. Despite their differences, on neither of our Caminos did we experience anything resembling this kind of emotion. It was disappointingly just another day's walk. But this year, as we entered the suburbs of the city, I did feel compelled to stop. We sat at a cafe and had a small snack, and I waited. I didn't want to leave. I wasn't ready for it to all be over. It was a strange emotion for me someone normally pushed to finish and to complete things. I thought back at how different this Camino had been. I was such a different person than I'd been in 2014. I relished the time lingering. I'd loved the times with other pilgrims. The journey, the destination, the goal had been so much less of a thing this year. I'd loved the times with Caroline, Gerhard and Edgar, and of course the kids. But the time with Allison is what I held most dear. Between the two trips, we'd now walked 1,100 miles together, not including the numerous hikes of training before both pilgrimages. We'd grown closer to others, closer to God, and closer to each other than ever before. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> the blessing and joy of this journey was the people we met and talked with made every day rewarding. People came from all walks of life, different places, and a variety of ages. The camaraderie is comparable to that of camping here at home. Pilgrims were mostly friendly, generous, and helpful. Even people just hiking for adventure seem to be affected by what I like to think of as the hand of God by opening their minds to appreciate people of different faiths and backgrounds. Every day I was able to enjoy spending time with people from all over the world. From day one, when a German family made a spot for me at the dinner table and made sure my plate was never empty, to spending time our last day in Santiago with the kids, who were always full of energy, the people made this trip truly enjoyable. I considered it a gift from God to be able to spend time with others and see Him shine through each person. God does love variety. The Camino de Santiago is a voyage like no other. It is ancient and long. It is a trek through terrain and history. It's a trip that can separate you from what is unnecessary and bring you in touch with what really matters. It is a place to walk alone and a place to make new friends. It is a pilgrimage.
about. What is Camino? It's the way. It's the ancient pilgrimage past Santiago, the seat of Bone to St. James. You can contemplate life and where you are in your walk with God, where you want to be going in the world, what you want to be doing, maybe some personal <laughs> aspects of things you want to change about yourself. So it's not just a hike? It's not just a hike, no. <laughs> it, can, it gives you time to, sounds funny as we're walking quickly and we sound a little winded, uh, to slow down <laughs> um, and, and look at life, uh, uh, your life in particular. Uh, do you like where it is, where you're going? It's funny, so many people we talk to um, say, oh, I just, I'm, I just want to slow down. I, I really need to slow down, but they don't slow down, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is, of course, exactly like us. Um, I think we do the same thing, but it's it's a bit um, it's funny. We all recognize it. I need to do it, but we're reluctant to do it somehow.